Puerto Rico is a country that is governed without the consent of the governed. Tensions are rising in Puerto Rico. In the midst of climate, economic, and political crises, natives fear the island is turning into a fiscal paradise for rich outsiders as more locals leave their land behind. It's designed for depending and extraction. And that's why they're giving incentives to non-Puerto Ricans to come to Puerto Rico. Is becoming a state the solution? This in-between status is embarrassing. Congress should say now yes or no to statehood to Puerto Rico. Why would I allow for somebody who abused me for 123 years to then consume me? Or is it becoming independent? If you depend on someone all of your life, you're not gonna grow. The Puerto Ricans are united. In order for you to grow, you have to be free and not to depend on someone. that's right outside the wall of San Juan, the old colonial wall. And these neighbors get together every Friday. They've been doing it for the last year and a half or so to play music, to play bomba y plena, and pass on the traditional Afro-Puerto Rican music. But because the wall belongs to the U.S. Park Service, they're not allowed to do it there anymore, so they moved here. La Perla is rich in color, character, and culture, but it's also a reminder of the inequality that exists in Puerto Rico. Growing up in San Juan, I remember hearing stories of how the people of La Perla had to fight to hold on to this desirable piece of land. Mi nombre es de mis abuelos. Mi abuelo el negro se encargaba de mantener la plaza, y pues en homenaje a él le pusieron el nombre a la plaza. Kayla Baez grew up knowing this public plaza steps away from her backyard like a piece of home. So when she wanted to bring her community together for a bate or a cultural ceremony, this was the obvious place to gather. Esta es la famosa plaza. Esta es la famosa plaza del negro. Aquí es donde nosotros comenzamos a separar esta plaza para nosotros para hacer nuestro bate. Y pues después de un Casi un año, faltan como dos semanas para un año. Parque Nacional nos dice que no podemos utilizarla. Pero es la plaza de ustedes de aquí, de, de la Perla. Es la plaza de la comunidad. O sea, es la plaza de la comunidad, una plaza, plaza pública a Parques Nacionales. Lo que pasa es que ellos dicen que después de la muralla tienen treinta y pico de pies de distancia que les pertenece. U.S. National Parks manages the colonial walls built by Puerto Rico's Spanish colonizers before the island was taken by the U.S. in the Spanish-American War. Puerto Rico is a Latin American nation, and it was invaded in 1898 by the United States for military geographic reasons. Then in 1917, they forced U.S. citizenship on the Puerto Ricans. Puerto Rico belongs to, but it's not a part of it. Right. That's what the U.S. Supreme Court says. Puerto Rico is a colony, a nation, a country that is governed without the consent of the governed, which is the case in Puerto Rico. U.S. Congress rules over Puerto Rico. U.S. Congress assigned a board to rule over Puerto Rico. And a country should not be ruled that way. Puerto Ricans are American citizens, but have no voting representation in Congress and can't vote for the president. But globally celebrated artists from Ricky Martin to Bad Bunny to Residente use their massive platforms to make sure the people of Puerto Rico are heard. This is the first time that Puerto Ricans are united this way. This is history. The U.S., they make things here, but nobody knows, and they'll do it, like, secretly. And Spain did it in our face, 
the U.S. do it like in our backs. From as far back as I remember, you're one of the very few global artists who has been very verbal and intentional about Puerto Rico's independence or the potential for independence. What has that been like in your career for you? To talk about independence in Puerto Rico at the beginning was very tough because they kind of block you, you know, they censor you. It's radio stations, the, the music industry in general. They don't say it like in your face, but they do it. Even my label uh, at that time, they were like, oh, I, I don't know if we're gonna sign him. They make you feel like you're, you're doing something wrong and you're just talking about freedom. If you depend on someone all of your life, you're not gonna grow. In order for you to grow, you have to be free and not to depend on someone. El campo, the countryside, smells different, feels different. It's a lot cooler up here. We're at about 2,000 feet altitude in Aibonito, in the center of the island. And this area has some of the richest land to grow essentially any kind of crop you want. We're here to meet with Tara and Daniela Rodriguez Besosa, two sisters who have spent the last decade and some change working to resuscitate Puerto Rico's food industry. One of the most important things we do is biodiversity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, right now we have 50, 60 different vegetables growing at the same time. Mm -hmm. they, they all help each other. And how common are farms like this one? They're becoming more and more common, which is great. But I think Hurricane Maria was pretty huge really? to kind of highlight the importance of what we're doing, uh, food insecurity, you know, the fact that literally here in our town, there was no food available for a really, really long time. Puerto Rico, before Hurricane Maria, was importing about 85% of its food and of everything else that you can imagine. We basically started importing up to 95, 97% of our food when Hurricane Maria and Irma swipe over the island. I think that food sovereignty is recognizing that all human beings have the right to the land, the resources necessary to be able to feed ourselves. Puerto Rico used to cultivate all of its food. People who used to cultivate everything they ate were taught to cultivate export products. So unlearn what you used to know about cultivating your own food, have this instead, buy it from me at the supermarket, and cultivate the export product. Most of the incentives that we have had for generations now in Puerto Rico are not meant to serve the people of Puerto Rico. It's not designed for thriving. It's designed for depending. It's designed for staying stuck and extraction extraction of crops, extraction of economy, extraction of knowledge, of extraction people. of people. By definition, a colony is an extractive resource. Officially, Puerto Rico is a commonwealth, a free associated state often referred to as ELA, Estado Libre Asociado in Spanish. And maintaining ELA is still a popular vision for Puerto Rico's status long term. Congress offered the people of Puerto Rico from 1950 to 1952 the power to write and approve our own constitution. And at that time, the United States government told the United Nations that Puerto Rico was no longer a colony, that we had a new status unique under the American flag, which is basically an autonomous body. I have defended Commonwealth all my life, but I have to recognize that all the decisions taken by Congress in the last 20 years, and perhaps in the last six years, and decisions taken by the United States Supreme Court basically treat Puerto Rico in the same uh, category that it's uh, Virgin Islands, Guam, and all the other territories, which territories is the way in the U.S. Constitution to call a colony. When I was a little girl growing up, I remember hearing lo mejor de los dos mundos, yeah. the best of both worlds. At what point do you realize that ELA is not lo mejor de los dos mundos? Because of the, uh, of the bankruptcy that Puerto Rico is uh, right now, and Congress approved a law in 2016 PROMESA, which created an unelected board that has more powers than the governor of Puerto Rico and the Puerto Rico legislature. The people of Puerto Rico need to know that they're not forgotten, that they're part of the American family, uh, and uh, 
uh, Congress's responsiveness to this issue, even though this is not a perfect bill, uh, at least moves us in the right direction. So right now we don't even have the power to approve our own budget. So right now we don't even have the power, to, uh, the total power of self-government. So that's why I said one thing is what they told us back in 1952, and the other thing is the reality we're living right now. The federally appointed board, locally known as La Junta, has imposed severe budget cuts as the way to start paying off the island's debt, owed in large part to Wall Street creditors. Before Promesa, Puerto Rico did not have an opportunity to restructure its debts to a more affordable level. In fact, no U.S. states had that opportunity either. Promesa provided Puerto Rico a unique chance to restructure and reduce its debt to sustainable levels. We caught on public education, we caught on uh, government programs, we caught on all the things that you should invest during a moment of crisis, right? We're going through close to 15, uh, 16 years of an economic crisis in which different administrations have implemented austerity policies in which working families in Puerto Rico, uh, university students in Puerto Rico have been asked to carry a heavier part of the burden while receiving less and less essential services, while at the same time, that same government that's asking you to sacrifice more because we're in a crisis and we need you to sacrifice is telling these individuals, come, come to Puerto Rico, vacation in Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. and in exchange for that, you don't pay taxes. And, and that's obviously uh, hypocrisy that the people of Puerto Rico are no longer uh, willing to tolerate. A recent attempt to stimulate the economy came in the form of two tax incentive programs now consolidated under the code of incentives known as Act 60. Companies and wealthy residents who relocate to Puerto Rico do pay some taxes, but they also get generous tax breaks to help drive development. What has been the impact of that? It has meant that many families have been displaced from the communities that they have lived for, for a very long time. It has turned our economy into a service economy in which Puerto Ricans can work at a restaurant, can work at a hotel, can work in the services industry, but they will never be able to visit those hotels that they were working for or eat at those restaurants that they're working for. I think it, it creates a situation in which Puerto Ricans, we become guests in our own island, and that's obviously not acceptable. Old San Juan has been ground zero of tourism. Puerto Ricans locally and tourists have always coexisted here, and many of the businesses are owned by locals. The idea that these buildings wouldn't be owned by Puerto Ricans because they become too expensive is a serious concern. To advocate for the beneficiaries of these incentives and attract more people to Puerto Rico, Rob Real founded the Act 2022 Society. Is it true that there's no requirement to actually create jobs? That's not exactly true. Uh, there's a de minimis requirement based on revenue, but... Um, One employee, correct? Correct. Were these incentives created for job creation? They actually weren't designed initially for job creation, but I think it's been an important byproduct. Uh, since uh, 2012, when the act started, there's been roughly, and this is in process of being updated, about an estimated 50,000 direct jobs at $37,000 a piece, which may not sound like a lot, but is almost twice the Puerto Rican household average. And secondarily, there's been about 100,000 indirect jobs that have been created, things for like construction, attorneys, accountants, hospitality, car dealers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's been meaningful, even though that wasn't the initial intention. The mandate for businesses to hire one local employee kicks in only after they make $3 million in revenue. And even then, that employee doesn't have to be Puerto Rican, just a resident. What about the concern about property values going up and being unaffordable to locals when you have such a wealthy population I, I, I buying think, a property? I think that's also a misconception because the properties that are being purchased in places like Dorado Beach are being purchased by wealthy families from other wealthy families. So there's, there's no gentrification actually taking place. 
Dorado, a beach town just 30 minutes west of San Juan, has gated communities featuring multi-million dollar homes and has attracted wealthy U.S. residents like YouTuber Logan Paul, who promotes Puerto Rico as both a tax haven and a kind of personal playground. I feel like people are wondering why Puerto Rico, right? Yeah. Like, how random. Yeah. Taxes. It's one, it's one vertical. Yeah. It's one. It's a big one. <laughs> Paul was recently in the news for defending his brother, Jake, who's being investigated for threatening endangered sea turtle nests by illegally driving on the beach. It's like a little oasis and everyone here drives uh, golf carts. It's like a giant game of Mario Karts for adults. Fernando Rodriguez is from Dorado and says the money in the gated communities hasn't flowed into the surrounding neighborhoods. How has Dorado changed over the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years? Well, this was more like country. So now it's just like more closed neighborhoods, more people. Um, I see more presence of people from the mainland come over here. People that, you know, are not part of the mix kind of, which is in a way kind of shorting our access because we have to pay the taxes that they don't. What saves them money costs us a lot of money. What does that do to y your community? What do you worry about? Uh, me living here in the future. I think the value of everything is going to keep going up or inflating. It's like, will I have my kids here? Will I continue my life here or will I have to go somewhere else? What does your community look like now versus when you were growing up? I would say more than 40 percent have has moved out to the States. A lot of them have stayed, but um, their sons are not buying there. Is this a prison? <laughs> no, this is paseos from the other side, <laughs> dividing us from them. Oh, wow. So all of this barbed wire is just to keep people out? Yes. And there's a bunch of concertina wire. wire. I mean, that's what they put on top of, like, the border wall. This is at the other side of their closed suburb. And the streets change. Right here, it's all broken up. Did, do you think these people on the other side of the road know what it's like here? I don't think they think about this at all. ¿Cómo han visto lo que está pasando al otro lado? Bueno, mijo, aquí estamos luchando a ver si no nos ahogan. ¿Se siente que los van a, los pueden sacar? Claro. So long as this is a tourist hotspot, People are gonna walk by these stickers every day. I like that that one says Abol en la Promesa. Abol en la Colonia en Abol en Promesa. Yeah. Abolish Act 60 is looking to call attention to the fact that Puerto Rico is being made into a tax haven. The worst case scenario is that we don't have a voice in our own country. Nicole Alvarez Espada grew up in the States. Now she's living in Puerto Rico, organizing and protesting against the displacement of Puerto Rican natives. It took four Puerto Ricans to leave Puerto Rico for my family to be what they are, right? My great-grandfather left because he was a nacionalista. He believed in Puerto Rican independence. But I think that the, the political pressure, along with the financial pressure, is what ultimately led to them leaving. My dad's side, they left because of what they thought were better opportunities, right? El engaño that is the American dream. For me, when I moved back to Puerto Rico, it was my act of resistance, right? It was me saying, um, okay, you displaced my grandmother, my grandfather, my family, even my parents. My parents came back for a period of time. Both of them were like, I can't do it here because no it was no opportunity. And so now I have the opportunity to come back, not under Act 60, not under any of these laws because I don't make enough money. Many administrations have tried to address the economic concerns of native Puerto Ricans, but they often blame the territorial status for the lack of working solutions. This here is the Constitution of Puerto Rico, Constitución del Estado Libre Asociado, which established the current form of government, the free associated state of Puerto Rico uh, in 1952. The three branches of government, like in the U.S. And a fun fact, this signature here is my great-grandfather. He was a representative for the San Juan District of Puerto Rico when they signed the Constitution. 
The current governor, Pedro Pierluisi, says the answer to the challenges facing Puerto Rico is to become the 51st state. How come we are citizens of the most democratic nation in the world, yet we do not vote for the president of that nation? How come we have no voting representation in Congress as American citizens? It's like geographic discrimination, and it makes no sense. We're not immigrants. See, what happens in Puerto Rico when our people do not have an adequate quality of life is that they hop on a plane and move. Over the last decade, Puerto Rico's population dropped by nearly 12%, a mass exodus largely driven by the fiscal crisis and Hurricane Maria. He got all the Puerto Ricans. He got, he got, he got. Puerto Ricans. <laughs> Governor Pierluisi is appealing to the nearly 6 million Puerto Ricans in the diaspora and the representatives in Congress to support the Statehood Admission Act, a bill that if passed and if a majority of locals voted for it in a binding referendum would make Puerto Rico a state. In the last non-binding referendum, 52% voted yes to statehood. The same courage we had in holding this vote Congress should have in saying to Puerto Rico with a straight face, you can have statehood or not. In what ways does statehood achieve economic development in Puerto Rico? Programs like Medicaid to uh, low, the low income population in the United States, uh, that program doesn't apply in Puerto Rico equally. And outside of public assistance. We have a vibrant manufacturing sector. Actually, close to half of our economy is manufacturing based. You don't have that anywhere else in the American hemisphere. How can you keep these incentives in place if Puerto Rico is a state? Eventually, tax-wise, we'll be on an equal footing with the states, but that's not going to happen overnight. And how do you convince Republicans that that's a good thing for them? We don't need to convince all members of Congress. We only need 50 plus one in both the House and the Senate. That's how statehood works. I admit that because of the current parliamentarian rules in the Senate, for some votes you need 60 uh, votes. So the, the going is tougher in the Senate. How do you reconcile providing these incentives for the super rich that the Biden administration is trying to increase taxes on with the idea of lobbying for statehood with Democrats in the state. Well, let's make Puerto Rico a state. As simple as that. You do that, and you don't need programs like this anymore. If you want to change this tax treatment that the residents of Puerto Rico have as a territory, then support statehood for Puerto Rico. But Puerto Ricans are very divided on the question of statehood, as are Democrats in Congress. And recently, Congresswomen Nidia Velasquez and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez introduced a competing bill that would create a constitutional convention where elected delegates would determine status options for Puerto Ricans to vote on, whether it's the status quo, statehood, independence, or something in between. Our bill, H.R. 2070, it contains and guarantees and mandates a full information campaign so that Puerto Ricans know what they're voting for. It doesn't say no to statehood. It doesn't mandate independence. What it mandates is a fully informed and just process that Puerto Ricans deserve. In recent years, Puerto Ricans have used their voices and their votes locally to change what they can. And through historic and ongoing protests, they fought back issues from corruption to the budget cuts imposed by La Junta, and in 2019, effectively pushed out the pro-statehead then-governor, Ricardo Rosselló. Two years ago, you were very much a part of the protests that were able to topple the governor, to get him out of the fortaleza of the governor's mansion. What do you think changed then? And how do you think the thinking has changed until now? I think that that situation, that protest, uh, was super important for us, for our self-esteem. I think that a, a, a whole genera generation changed after that. They believe now that if they protest, they can change things, and that's very important to have at least that hope. When you are a territory like we are, there's always the political risk 
of Puerto Rico, let's say, becoming an independent nation or a sovereign nation and severing its ties with the United States. Having a permanent relationship with the U.S. brings a lot of political stability and uh, makes us more attractive for investment purposes. That's what happened in Hawaii, it happened in Alaska, just to pick two territories that became states and that were quite different than the rest of the states. So the same should happen in Puerto Rico. The worst case scenario is that we don't have a voice in our own country. Hawaii was forced into being a state. Americans were incentivized in, Hawaiians were pushed out, and those that stayed, not many of them are above the poverty line. As a young activist here, um, how, are you hopeful? Where do you see things going over the next few years? Yeah. What are you seeing, you know, movements getting I to? am hopeful because I think the reality is, is that the other side doesn't make sense, right? Being a state doesn't make sense. Why would I allow for somebody who abused me for 123 years to then consume me? Regardless if you're a supporter of statehood in Congress, regardless if you're a supporter of independence in Congress, a democratic response to the question of whether Puerto Rico should become a state, whether Puerto Rico should become independent, whether Puerto Rico should become a free association nation with the United States, it's that's a question for Puerto Ricans to decide. Hey, thanks for checking out CBS and Originals on YouTube. If you want to watch more documentaries, download the free CBS News app on your phone, tablet, smart TV, or any streaming device. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking down here. Thanks for watching.